Recently, I passed 10,000 subscribers on YouTube, and since I've been wanting to do a video like this for a while, there seems to be no better time than now. There have been some pretty juicy comments piling up on a handful of my videos, garnering enough intrigue from me and especially from a lot of viewers to warrant continuing the conversation on those topics. Through my channel, I want to foster critical thinking and debate for what I cover and anything and everything else. So if you love discussing art, culture, or ideas in an analytical way, then I want you to feel at home here. Sincerely. Now, if you want to break down those same topics through ideological or even cult-like lenses, and your arguments consist of appeals to emotion and novelty, then you are certainly welcome on this channel as well. You can just sit at the kiddies table. Before I get to the comments that will make up the bulk of this video, I wanted to address some prevailing sentiments I've noticed in the comment sections across my channel. And there is nothing that I would like to snuff out as much as the idea that I believe myself to be infallible, or even what I consider to be just as bad, any more capable of analyzing and creating arguments than any of you. While there are certain things I wish I could rip out of some of my older videos, because they are either objective mistakes or I've since learned better, I do believe my arguments to be well-founded. That is largely why I take so long to publish videos other creators might have out in half the time. I am a judgmental person by nature, and I apply the same standards of scrutiny to my own works that I do to those of others. I do not believe my videos are flawless and would be more than willing to amend or correct any of my points if someone can make a better argument against them. That being said, the reason I get into it so often in the comments is because some of you make terrible arguments. I also don't believe my videos are exhaustive explorations of the topics I cover, so I see the comments section as the most suitable place to continue discussions for all to see. Which brings me to the next trend I've noticed. Some of you can considered in poor taste that I pin the comments I vehemently disagree with. For the uninitiated, a pinned comment will always appear at the top of a comment section for a given video, meaning that it's the likeliest to be the first comment anyone sees. And while I can understand how some people might find it distasteful to do so, I think they misunderstand my intentions. If I want to reply to a comment, I'm going to, and literally anyone would be able to see if I did. Sometimes I think that a particular comment helps bolster my own points, and other times, I think that a comment is so perfectly representative of the polar opposite of my position that I want to make my case against it clear for everyone who watched that video and might be interested in further discussion. And sometimes I'll pin a comment for no reason other than the fact that I have the power to, mwahaha. Either way, I assume that the people who comment on my videos are intelligent human beings capable of taking responsibility for what they say online. If they didn't want the spotlight put on their comment, they shouldn't have published it. And if they regret having posted it, they can delete it whenever they want. No matter how offbeat or unfounded some of the things you guys post are, I would rather allow everyone to share their thoughts than make even a few of you feel as though you can't. After all, there is no debate if we agree on everything. And from another perspective, I'm pretty sure the algorithm likes it when you guys go mad in the comments. I genuinely wasn't aware of this before, but my videos covering Eyes Wide Shut and Invincible seem to have only benefited from the passionate and at times rabid commenting, which I really like. Full disclosure, if I can get more traffic on my videos simply by engaging with the commenters, then I am absolutely going to do so. So by all means, keep the bad takes coming. And the last thing I want to address, which will serve as a good segue into the main responses, is a little matter of mispronunciation on the aforementioned Eyes Wide Shut analysis. I got a couple comments about this, and I figure you're all owed an explanation. Long story short, in the earlier drafts of the Eyes Wide Shut breakdown, I included a lot more jokes, gags, and broadly speaking, instances of me not taking myself seriously. For example, in one of the final drafts of the video, I had typed out like 26 different slang terms for the non-monetizable activities and imagery in the movie, and those words were displayed over the black boxes I used to censor those scenes. Tatas, badonkers, sweatermelons, these were just some of the terms that accompanied my analysis, and when I watched that version of the video, I decided that it conflicted too heavily with the otherwise clinical script I was presenting. That, along with other gags, were left on the cutting room floor. However, the line about everyone in New York having the horny, the cutaway to Bohemian Grove, and most importantly, Morgu, stayed in. And I have no reason for keeping it there besides the fact that I found it funny to hear in a film analysis that took itself seriously most of the time. So I'm a child, sue me. Now I'm not sure why so many people felt so strongly about the pronunciation of the word, but I assure you I know it's not pronounced Morgu. Like, come on, they say it in the movie, okay? I know it's not pronounced Morgu. I know it's not pronounced Morgu. And lastly, for real this time, I would like to preemptively address any criticisms of the selection of comments in this response video. I cherry-picked them. Still, there's likely to be someone in the comments of this video who thinks they're doing something by pointing out that I only chose the comments that made the opposition look bad, or that I deliberately sought out easy targets. No, in fact, one of the themes you'll notice across these comments is that they represent ideas that a great many people either comfortably agree with or believe to be unquestionably true. While I disagree with them, which is why I'm making this video, I do not feel their arguments should be disregarded. And as a side note, if I see a comment so stupid that it's not worth a reply, I just ignore it, because some arguments are worth disregarding. As tempting as it may be to go 
after low-hanging fruit, we must pick our battles. I truly believe that the comments I chose for this video broach topics that are worth discussing, but please, make no mistake, I feel no obligation to take anything I cover seriously and I often treat subjects without the respect others would afford them. This is not me absolving myself of responsibility for what I say or hiding behind the shield of satire, far from it. I'm simply clarifying my thought process. I do take certain subjects very seriously, but in the interest of substantive discussion it can be beneficial to disassociate from what I value, via objectivity or mockery or any number of other routes. Recognizing and acknowledging the absurdity inherent in all facets of life is something integral to my method and a concept I hope all my viewers will embrace. While I am sadly unable to cite the source for this, one of my favorite quotes is, if we don't find reasons to laugh at tragedies, no good will ever come of them. The quote was in reference to a joke about 9-11, but it's not hard to see how we could apply it anywhere. Onto the video then. This is such a poorly constructed observation wrapped around the illusion of a well-made argument. Before ferociously debating the existence of a song like WAP, you should have first asked yourself, okay, wait, wait. Firstly, I love this framing tactic. Addressing an argument as denying the existence or right to exist of a person or concept. I'm not debating the existence of WAP. I'm criticizing it under the assumption that it is a very real piece of media that had other people's stomachs churning as much as it did mine. Another thing I love is the reliance on a myopic view of world history. Things have only changed because capitalists realize they can make money off of exploring both the male and the female bodies. Organized religion certainly has done a lot to control and suppress human sexuality over the centuries, but around the corner from a church in just about any old-timey town, you'd be hard-pressed not to find some lowlives expressing their sexuality. Like, have you ever heard of a brothel? They're not exactly a new phenomenon. And they're just one example of how capitalists have been taking advantage of female sexuality for centuries. It's so evident from arguments like this that these people live in timelines that don't go back any further than 2015. And then there's the ridiculous dichotomies they set up to frame their ideological faction as the good guys. Sex? Good. Capitalism? Bad. Identity politics? Good. Organized religion? Bad. Nuance? Never heard of it. Substantiation? Don't know the meaning of the word. What is it about sexual imagery that triggers me so much? Well, as with any type of imagery, the effect that it has on the viewer is largely contextual. I wouldn't say that sexual imagery, in general, triggers me. No, that's not the word I would use. However, under the right circumstances, I would say that licentious behavior and rhetoric leaves a bad taste in my mouth. And hey, you're welcome to disagree. It makes it all the more clear how I should interact with you. That being not at all. And this is now suddenly an issue whose blame can be attributed to feminists and the movement of sexual liberation. It's appalling that someone can actually come to that conclusion. Yeah, I'll admit, it does seem like there are a few pieces missing in that puzzle, but I gotta know, who is coming to that conclusion? Because I never made that connection. And based on everything else in the comment, I can't help but think that this is one of those cases of an individual having an entire debate planned out in their head, assuming what the opposition will say in reply to their points, and then making their case as though they understand the flow of the conversation in advance. I get the feeling this commenter didn't watch the video all the way through. As for why I'm bothered with the normalization of sex in mainstream media, I'm not necessarily. But the way that they were framing my arguments neglects the research that I did to bolster my points. I'm disheartened by the ever-increasing popularity of the perversion of standards for beauty and empowerment. I feel this way because I have seen no evidence that sex work and the mainstreaming thereof could in any way be beneficial for us as individuals or as a society. I covered these studies in two other videos already, so to make a long story short, there are a few trends we can observe across long-term exposure to sex work. Firstly, that the desire for self-care diminishes as individuals become further detached from their identities as a result of feeling unable to control their circumstances. Secondly, that individuals experience increased rates of mental illness, STD contraction, and substance use as the effects of depersonalization worsen. And thirdly, that the detrimental effects of sex work are frighteningly consistent across individuals regardless of consent or age. To clarify what I just said, the impact that sex work has on the psyche of a consenting adult is congruent with the impact that it has on a non-consenting adult, and said results have also been observed in child sex workers. That is what we're calling them now, right? Prostitute and human trafficking victim are outdated nomenclature now, I believe. Being myself, I thought it would be much more difficult to find an example like this, but it was actually really easy. In Invincible, when Mark is understandably uncomfortable about his parents getting flirty right in front of him, Debbie stands her ground and says that he should be happy that his parents have a healthy sexual relationship, leading a flustered Mark to remove himself from the situation. Here, we see fictional characters acting in believable ways to explore real human emotions and issues in a manner that is consistent with their characters the rest of the time. This is normalizing sex in media. This is devolution. 
a regression in standards for art and beauty, a regression in terms of what behavior we deem acceptable to publicly exhibit, and a regression in what we, as a culture, tolerate from an entertainment industry that's getting more exposure by the day for its unbridled depravity. You are more than welcome to disagree with that sentiment, but I'm only appealing to the sensible viewers out there. The line in the sand was crossed long ago. If you don't want this to be the norm for your loved ones, particularly your mother, wife, or even daughter, then we have a monumental game of catch-up to play. Standards are not upheld by internet discussions, they need to be practiced in our thought and behavior. That's not to say any amount of browbeating will fix our societal decline. It's to say that if you value decency and integrity, the content of one's character, then you have a responsibility to call out blatant corruption when you see it. Ideas are infectious. The support and in many cases the celebration of these ideas is why they've become the norm. But now we know better. Course correction means remaining consistent with our principles, ideally those which are based on rationality. But honestly, what we've got now makes a complete return to anarcho-primitivism look like an upgrade. Here's another comment from the same video. Now, when I chose to have Doom gameplay in the background of that video, I was trying to present a contrast between my speech and what was on screen, but reaching the conclusion that it was commentary on violence as entertainment seems like a bit of a stretch for a gotcha. What's more accurate, based on direct references to the script and gameplay footage, is that I am metaphorically aligning myself with the Doom Slayer and the sex workers who mean to propagate their lifestyles to the demons. And, wielding an arsenal of facts and logic, I systematically rip and tear their disingenuous, whoremongering beliefs in a concerted effort to rid the world of their degeneracy once and for all. Now, while that interpretation is more accurate to the material we have to work with, it's wildly outlandish and a bit too optimistic for one of my videos. No, the relationship between scrutinizing WAP and having Doom gameplay in the background is simple. You can only combat that which is cringe with that which is based. Supporting sex work is cringe. Super cringe. Like, one of the cringiest things out there right now. Believing that the mass exploitation of women under the false pretense of it being empowering for anyone involved is cringe. Doom is based. It's that simple. The next comment was posted on the Wind River vs. Nightingale video, which remains one of my personal favorites. I'm really happy that I covered those movies, and if you're not at least going to watch Wind River before listening to my response to the comment, then checking out the video itself would give you a better insight into what's being discussed here. Spoiler warning out of the way, here we go. I think you should acknowledge, in another video, the harmful elements of the film Wind River. In particular, the portrayal of indigenous people being unable to help themselves, and that they need the assistance of white people. So, there is a lot to unpack here. This is an important comment because, I'm pretty sure at least, it represents how many people see films. And the sentiment isn't even exclusive to racially involved films. It seems to be a matter of the lenses through which audiences choose to view art. And this lens in particular, the lens of racial identity, or any number of other labels you could feasibly assign to it, is a concept worth exploring before rejecting, but it is worth rejecting all the same. As the story goes, a young woman named Natalie is raped by one of her boyfriend Matt's colleagues while several other colleagues await their turn, but escapes while Matt sacrifices himself for her. Her body is found the next morning, five miles away from the scene of the crime. A tracker named Corey Lambert takes a personal interest in the case because his daughter, who was friends with Natalie, disappeared years earlier in an eerily similar manner. He joins FBI agent Jane Banner in the investigation, which leads them to the oil rig where the crime took place. After a shootout between the cops and security guards, Lambert gets a confession from Natalie's rapist and intimidates him into dying the same way Natalie did. The film closes with Lambert and Natalie's father Martin sharing a moment of silence for their daughters as a tragic statistic appears on screen. Claiming that indigenous people not being able to help themselves and requiring white people's assistance is even an element of Wind River is pitifully misguided. The residents of the Wind River Reservation are struggling, yes, but they aren't helpless victims. The most salient case we see is a young delinquent who has relative agency, but sees no alternative to his destructive lifestyle. These people are suffering in very real ways, just like people all over the planet are. If you think that these circumstances are exclusive to those living in Native American reservations, then I don't know how to continue the discussion with you. Moreover, I am deliberately ignoring any of to the real world Wind River because I don't know nearly enough to comment on its situation. I'm purely discussing the events of the film as they were portrayed in the film. The idea that these characters need white people's help is not only insanely patronizing, it contradicts what happens in the movie. The final scene is Lambert and Martin sitting in mourning as even though Natalie's rapist is dead and Lambert feels a sense of atonement for not finding his own daughter after her disappearance, there's nothing that can bring them back. And it appears as if there's some kind of cosmic cruelty at play in their lives as, of all the people who could suffer this tragedy, it was their daughters of the same age at one time close friends. This conclusion is so bittersweet, memorable, and powerful that analyzing it for its racial dynamics alone is nothing but disingenuous. And asserting that this is what it 
looks like for white people to help indigenous people is asinine. The point of the film is that nothing and no one can help. Lambert got revenge, but no holes were mended and no scars healed. The fathers simply go on living. Viewing Wind River primarily through the lens of race and coming away with the idea that it makes Native Americans out to look bad is batshit crazy. This movie frames white men as the devil. White people in Wind River do far more harm than good. If you were serious about boiling it down to simply skin color, then Wind River can be described as white men rape a native woman and kill her white boyfriend. Native woman escapes but dies from exposure. White tracker and white FBI agent attempt to solve the native woman's case. Gunfight kills all but one of the white rapists. White tracker gets revenge for native woman's death and the disappearance of his own half-native daughter. White tracker and native woman's father share bittersweet ending. Essentially, the only white people who aren't irredeemable villains were the FBI agent, the local cops who died working the case, and the tracker who married into Native American culture. You could go as far as to say that he was probably evil too, but gained some humanity after spending time with natives and raising half-native children. If you choose to view this heartfelt, sincere film through the narrow-minded lens of racial identity alone. It's so easy too. What are your references for that interpretation? Well, look, they are that skin color, so it must be significant. Great. So the standard for making valid film criticism has sunk as low as merely having eyes. That's not to say that race isn't important to the themes of Wind River, it overtly is, but it's far more compelling and better integrated into the story than identity politics is capable of recognizing. We are past the point where such ideology is worthy of goodwill. It has done nothing but pervert the quality of art and prime well-meaning people to focus on details that wouldn't and shouldn't otherwise matter. We should dismiss purely identity-based interpretations of art, because no piece of art worth discussing at length is as simple as this race good, this race not good. What kind of person do you have to be to see that everywhere and even want more of it? Go get your bigoted confirmation bias validated somewhere else. Art is nuanced, and Wind River's actual overtone of racial victimization is supported by a solid script, excellent performances, obvious references, and real-world data. No partisan pandering, shameless virtue signaling, or concessions with realism to facilitate petty payoffs. The fact that Wind River was even made at the time it was is miracle enough. Don't try to drag it through the mud you've been guilt-tripped and rage-baited into calling home because you are only detracting from how good it really is. Moving on, this is the comment I have pinned, for now, on my analysis of Eyes Wide Shut. Analyzing this without mentioning the occult is akin to analyzing Forrest Gump without mentioning chocolate or shrimp. Now, I still stand by what I wrote in my reply to that comment, but I've chosen to make a comprehensive response here because I've noticed that sentiment as well as a few others are quite popular in that comment section. I feel that this comment in particular encapsulates so much of what the other comments say in less friendly ways that responding to it would effectively be killing a few birds with one stone. And since I really don't know where to start, I'll just go as far back in time as is relevant. I'm only doing so because of the sheer amount of comments criticizing me for either being ignorant of what real-world elites and secret societies do, or trying to pull the wool over people's eyes by covering for them. When I was in high school, my English class regularly had to do individual oral assignments. Each student would be given a sheet of paper with a dozen or so topics on it, and they would have to write and present a speech on the topic of their choice. I love these assignments, and while I don't remember what the topic was for this particular speech, when I was 17, I wrote and presented a speech that covered Jeffrey Epstein, Jimmy Savile, and the Queen's relation to Vlad the Impaler. And before you ask, no, the prescribed topics were nowhere near that controversial, I just found a way to include what I actually cared about and wanted to talk about at the time. You know those April Fool's videos I do where I discuss extra-dimensional vibe vampires and the globalist cabal ruling over us from the shadows? Well, I covered the Archons and the Bilderberg group in that high school speech as well. I was interested in conspiracies long before I started doing YouTube, and I see no reason to stop asking questions now. There are snaky movements going on around us, small and large scale. I don't deny that, but I also don't obsess over it to the point where it invades and distorts everything I enjoy doing. The theme of elite power is integral to Eyes Wide Shut, and the Summerton Mansion scene is a standout for the tonal shift it confronts the viewer with. However, the Summerton Mansion scene is less than 10% of the whole film, and the Secret Society conspiracy theme is but one of a host of concepts that Eyes Wide Shut explores. You don't see me arguing that people are missing the point for not acknowledging the significance of mannequin heads in Kubrick's films, do you? Eyes Wide Shut is clearly a movie about secret societies and elite corruption. I don't need to point out the parallels between the activities in the film and what allegedly takes place in real life for you to know that the similarities exist. And you don't need your beliefs validated by a random YouTuber with no expertise in the occult or conspiracy research. I wanted to make an in-depth film analysis, so I 
did some research and came across some excellent resources that shed light on the insane attention to detail and meticulously integrated themes in Eyes Wide Shut. I hate that I need to keep repeating this, but some people just don't understand. I analyzed Eyes Wide Shut as a film, not a documentary or expose of what is really going on in the world. Powerful people do despicable things and there is evidence of it everywhere. You don't have an inside track on the New World Order just because you let mug globalists live rent free in your head. You aren't special for making the connection between child sexual exploitation in a film and child sexual exploitation in real life. You're playing connect the dots with the lines already traced for you. If you want to discuss what happened to John McAfee, or how Bill Cosby was miraculously let go, or even if the moon landing really happened, then more power to you. I love talking about controversy too, and I'll entertain just about any idea long enough to hear a compelling case for it. But if you're going to decry the author of a film analysis for not coming to the same extreme conclusions you did, then you should know how much of a delusional tweaker you look like. Regarding the worst thing about Invincible, I got into quite the exchange with one particular commenter, and noticed that their arguments actually had a good deal of support from other viewers. And now we're here. It is difficult to convey tone through a text message, and so when you read a comment as harsh as mine, no one would fault you for assuming that I was red in the face smashing my keyboard to type this reply. But the strongest emotion I felt while typing that out was disappointment. I really thought I had laid out a strong case for Amber representing the worst of what Invincible as a show had to offer, but after reading through so many comments that disagree with that notion, I've only been given more reason to believe it. Obviously, there is common ground here. I believe Amber's actions are indefensible, and Faceup believes she is a bad character. Where we diverge seems to be that Faceup believes that further development of Amber's character would recontextualize her actions in Season 1 for the better. While I maintain that from everything we've seen of Amber thus far, it is completely rational to assert that she is an unlikable snake and that the consequences of her bad behavior, on the quality of the show's writing, are immedicable. And here's why. Yes, Amber could have plenty of context for her horrible character, but that wasn't in the show. Just because they could introduce it next season doesn't rectify the damage she does to season 1, particularly because Amber's most egregious blunder was contained within the last three episodes. She threw a hissy fit after Mark saved her life, almost cheated on him, admitted that she had known his secret for weeks, and welcomed him back after watching his father nearly kill him with no apology. Unless I'm missing something, that is enough context on which to base a judgment of her character. I'll agree with you that Amber experiences relatable emotions considering her circumstances, but it's how she acts on those emotions that is, bizarrely, in contention. From the comments I've read, it seems that Faceup does think Amber is a bad character, but they'd like more backstory and context that would help flesh out her character. Great. We're on the same page. I would love something, anything, to inform her character in Season 1, because as it stands, she is terrible writing distilled. I did not say that there is nothing that could possibly account for Amber's behavior in Season 1. I said that there is nothing that can justify it. Explaining something and proving it to be reasonable are very different matters. In Season 1, Amber starts dating Mark. In Season 1, Mark repeatedly flakes on Amber. In Season 1, Amber gives Mark several chances to redeem himself and he fails to do so because he has more important things to deal with. In Season 1, Amber deduces that he is actually a superhero, watches him fend off a bloodthirsty zombie cyborg, thus saving dozens of innocent bystanders, and chooses to throw a tantrum because he didn't let her in on the secret, which she already knew. How insufferably entitled do you have to be to act this way, and how feeble do you have to be to sympathize with someone who does? No matter what context is given to her character after the fact, her actions are irremediable and the effects of those actions are final. How is any amount of post-talk explaining going to rectify Mark being a bitch in Amber's presence, or his friends berating him for choosing his response? responsibility as a hero over his responsibility as a boyfriend. The damage is so minimal that it's an undertone. Mark's pivotal moment with Omni-Man is all about standing up for himself and humanity against Viltrumite tyranny. He endures immense suffering in the name of freedom and demonstrates how resilient his spirit is. Additionally, he's showing his father that he's got a spine and that his love for his mother trumps whatever nonsensical mandates the Viltrumites impose on him. Mark's development there is undermined by his reuniting with Amber. Mark is not the one who needs another chance. If the show paid attention to what happened minutes prior to that scene, Mark would want nothing to do with Amber. By that point, he's outgrown her. The damage that Amber inflicts on the writing is by no means an undertone. It clashes with the main character's ultimate development, effectively undoing the progress we saw take place during the show's narrative peak, when audience investment would have been at its highest and the stakes at their most significant. Amber and Mark could very well make up after this, but the narrative will retain that scar forever. You say there's nothing that can justify it, but that's a really bad way to look at things. That, to me, means that you never give anyone a second chance, ever, because the damage is already done. That's a very poorly chosen, close-minded outlook on life. I'll throw it right back at you. 
You say, we don't know where her outright hatred of lying stems from, as though learning the reason behind it will alleviate the detrimental impact Amber had on the characters around her and the show's writing. That, to me, means that you've been a doormat in every relationship you've ever been in, because no matter what abuse gets thrown at you, there's always hope for improvement around the corner. That's a very misguided, pathetic outlook on life. You see what sorts of argumentative stretches are possible when you assume the worst of the other party and play armchair psychologist? And no, retcon is not a subjective concept. By definition, a retcon necessarily must have a measurable impact on writing. If in Season 2 it is revealed that Nolan's species, the Viltrumites, are devoted to subjugating planets in order to build a galactic turnip farm, that will not be a retcon because I feel that it is. Another sentiment I've seen pop up across a few comments is that Mark was in the wrong the whole time for holding his secret identity in such high regard. The argument, I believe, being that secret identities are more of a trope than an actual safeguard against unwanted attention, which is a single idea that undermines a ton of superhero-related media. There are a lot of angles to cover this from, especially with regards to Invincible alone, but I'm going to go ahead and stick with just one. Mark is a fledgling superhero who values the concept and tradition of secret identities. When speaking to Eve about Amber, she says, Once you tell someone your secret identity, that's it. So if you're going to tell Amber the truth, you'd better be serious about her. Are you serious about her, Mark? This one line goes quite a ways to both inform our understanding of these characters' views on secret identities, and to influence Mark's journey moving forward. He is, to put it kindly, uncertain. Personally, I don't blame him. He does have a lot on his plate, and that bleeds through to his relationship with Amber. He's not sure whether he really wants to commit to her, and so withholds what is obviously privileged information. Once again, I'm not addressing the efficacy of secret identities, that's a discussion for another time. My case is simply that Mark has reason to believe that his secret identity is precious, and that his responsibilities as a hero outweigh his responsibilities as a boyfriend. He's got a lot of things to take seriously in his day to day. Amber is not only not a priority, she is a burden he keeps around because he actually has feelings for her. Stringing her along would imply that Mark was misleading her, especially with regards to his intentions. And yet, in episode 6, right before the zombie cyborg attacks, Mark makes his intentions clear, and it turns out they're a perfectly sensible continuation of his intentions leading up to that interaction. His intentions with Amber remained, from what little we see, extremely consistent. At the same time, however, he was dealing with the extreme responsibility of being a superhero and chose to leave Amber in the dark, which he, and any other superhero, have the right to do. A secret identity is a matter of an individual's privacy, which they and they alone have the right to withhold or disclose. A similar philosophy to that of my body, my choice. Except, you know, only one body is involved in this case. Mark believes his secret identity carries a lot of weight to it and isn't sure he wants Amber to know, which is completely understandable based on what we see him go through. And don't you dare make the argument that teenagers are irrational and dumb in defense of Amber and simultaneously assert that Mark should have dispensed with his secret much earlier. Holding your secret identity in such esteem may very well be a dumb decision in the grand scheme of things, but it's a perfectly logical dumb decision from Mark's perspective. Another sentiment I've noticed that's gained traction in this video's comments is that I'm a hypocrite for saying that good characters have flaws, saying that Amber is a bad character, and then detailing her flaws at length. Please, allow me to clarify. I do believe Amber has flaws, pretty significant ones in fact. What's weird is that Invincible, the show, doesn't acknowledge them. Blackmail, attempting to cheat, lying, browbeating, all these activities are glossed over, but considering how nonchalantly Amber engages in them, are fundamental parts of her character. The issue is not that Amber is flawless, she's far from it, the issue is that the show puts her on a pedestal and ignores her obvious flaws, which manifest themselves as her being petty and contemptible and have immediate disastrous effects on everything around her. So if you started dating someone and found out we're a superhero, you would totally okay every time they fly away to go save someone? You wouldn't start feeling left out? You wouldn't start feeling pushed away? Distant? Let on? I'll tell you what, face up. If I had suspected my partner of lying to me for months and then discovered they were doing it to hide a secret identity, I would not hold on to that information, freak out when I get lied to again, try to cheat on my partner, and act like a smug know-it-all when they muster the nerve to finally reveal it to me. I personally speaking, would probably either confront my partner to tell them that I know so that maybe the relationship can have better communication moving forward, or confront them to tell them that I'm leaving because I don't want a relationship hampered by the hazardous responsibilities of superherodom. I think those courses of action are understandable. What Amber did could not be less relatable or sympathetic unless she beat Mark every time he interrupted her. She did the mature thing and ended it. <laughs> Mark was lying to Amber. 
Mark was trying and failing to hold a relationship with her together, not stringing her along. He actually loved her. Mark kept his secret from Amber for months, flaked on her for months, and lied to excuse his behavior for months. That is not up for debate. I take it for granted every time I say that Amber belongs to the streets. Now that that's been established, let's look, in equally dispassionate terms, at what Amber did. Blackmailed Todd to give Mark her number, not up to a great start, cozied up to Mark even though he left her alone for an hour on their first study date, continued dating him for months while tolerating his repeated flaking, discovered Mark's secret and played the fool for weeks even after he nearly died, and then threw a hissy fit after Mark lied to save her and several dozen students on a college campus, and flirted with the idea of cheating on him. She's allowed to be upset. Of course she's allowed to indulge in egotistic and toxic behavior. In fact, anyone can do so, even in real life, for as long as they want, just as we're allowed to hold them accountable and evaluate the effects of their actions. Right? If an alcoholic goes into recovery and starts doing better, does that negate the fact that they were a bad boyfriend or husband in the past? That's the issue here. <laughs> Face up, I can't tell. Do you actually think that Mark's superhero business was more important than Amber or not? Because this is disingenuous and idiotic. There is no equivalence between Mark and Amber. Amber can give 1000% of herself in the relationship and Mark would still have more responsibility to save people and fight crime than spend time with her. It's insane that I have to go to such lengths to explain what most people would consider basic arithmetic. Amber, pretty girl, make Mark feel good. Superherodom, dangerous but necessary to protect people from overwhelming evil. Amber, not priority. Please excuse me if I sound patronizing, but I don't know how you couldn't wrap your head around this the first time. If you think that neglecting your significant other in order to save lives and fight crime is in any way equivalent to abusing them with your alcoholism, then I don't think the discussion needs to go any further. I've made my points clear, and you've given me enough reason to believe that you don't or won't see the flaws in your own points. I hate to end on a note like that, but I can only tolerate so much vapid rationalization at a time. I think the one thing we can agree on is that Amber is in desperate need of work. While she certainly isn't beyond redemption, the terrible impact her actions had on the show are set in stone. Short of a massive retcon, or several massive retcons, which could easily bring with them more problems than solutions, Amber's effect on season 1 is irreparable. I hope that season 2 handles her better, because she is one of the few blots on Invincible's otherwise impeccable cast. As always, I love discussion and debate, so if you have any criticism of my responses to your comments, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. See you next time.